Now, this is the fourth evening that we've been studying the book of Revelation, and we come to the second of these seven letters to the churches, the letter to the church at Smyrna. Smyrna, of course, is the one city which is probably still a major city in the ancient world. It is the modern city of Izmir. And those of you who have traveled to that part of the world will know that that still is a very large and very major city. Smyrna is reputed to have been the birthplace of Homer, the Greek epic poet, and was famed as the place which had the largest theater in the whole of Asia. It had magnificent architecture, and most of it was in multitudes of temples which were raised up to various gods and goddesses, some of them familiar, gods like Zeus, others very unfamiliar, minor deities, but the whole of Smyrna was full of pagan architecture. And that was part of the ethos of this city. It was a city which was refined in its culture, but pagan in its philosophy. So no religion which in any sense challenged or thwarted Greek culture would ever be popular in Smyrna. And Smyrna, of course, was a place where there was a church of Jesus Christ, a small company, as it seems, of God's people, but a growing company. And their very growth was one of the things that challenged the ancient culture of this Greek city. But Smyrna was not only a place which was full of Greek culture, it was also a city which was strongly tied to the Roman Empire, inasmuch as it was part of the legal foundation of the city of Smyrna that the emperor had to be worshipped as God. So you can understand that there was great pressure from the Greek culture in this city, which was pagan, and from the Roman imperial power in this city, which, of course, was a direct challenge to the Christian gospel because it demanded not just respect for authority, which would have been a Christian position, but worship of Caesar as a deity. And to complicate the situation, Smyrna was also the home of a very substantial Jewish community. It was a commercially prosperous area, and one of the reasons was that the gifted Jewish people had made it so. So there was a synagogue in Smyrna and a strong Jewish influence. Now you may know that the one group of people who were excused from worshipping Caesar as God were the Jews. And under the umbrella of being a sect of Judaism, the Christian church for some time enjoyed the same kind of immunity. But what was happening in Smyrna at this time was that the Jews were disowning the Christians and thereby exposing them to the problems of being treason, treasonous in their attitude 
to Rome. So they had two charges. There was a double charge against the Christians in Smyrna. One was that they were blasphemous. They refused to acknowledge the existence of the gods. And the other was that they had become treasonable. That is, they refused to worship the emperor. Now that was what lay behind a great deal of the suffering that took place amongst Christians in Smyrna. And the key to everything that the exalted Christ has to say to the Christians in Smyrna is this whole concept of suffering. You will notice the very first thing that Christ says in verse 9 directly to them about themselves is, I know your afflictions. The most famous Christian who came from Smyrna was a man whose name you may know, the man who rose eventually to become the bishop of Smyrna, called Polycarp. And Polycarp is one of the famous martyrs of the early church. He was the bishop of Smyrna, and at the age of 86, he was taken away one day and was tried on these charges of blasphemy and of treason. Let me read to you the account uh, which comes from the documents illustrative of the history of the Christian church. It was 22nd of February, probably in the year A.D. 156. The venerable bishop of Smyrna, who had fled from the city at the entreaty of his congregation, was tracked down to his hiding place. He made no attempt to flee. Instead, he offered food and drink to his captors and asked permission to retire for prayer, which he did for two hours. Then as they drove into the city, the officer in charge urged him to recant. What harm can it do, he asked, to sacrifice to the emperor? Polycarp refused. On arrival, he was roughly pushed out of the carriage and brought before the proconsul in the atmosphere, in, in the amphitheater, who addressed him thus, Have respect to your old age, sir. Swear by the genius of Caesar. There was silence. Again he tried. Swear and I will release you. Revile Christ's name. To which Polycarp replied, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? The proconsul persisted, swear by the genius of Caesar. I have wild beasts if you will not change your mind. I will throw you to them. Bid them be brought. And as you despise the beasts, unless you change your mind, I will make you to be destroyed by fire. Infuriated, both the Jews and the Romans gathered wood for the pile. Polycarp stood by the stake, asking not to be fastened to it, and prayed, O Lord God Almighty, the Father of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, through whom we have received a knowledge of thee. I thank thee that thou hast thought me worthy this day and this hour to share the cup of Christ among the number of thy witnesses. The fire was kindled, And as the wind drove the flames away from him and prolonged his agony, a soldier's sword put an end to his misery. Polycarp was burned at the stake, and in Smyrna that apparently was not an uncommon thing to happen, but many Christians were certainly fed to wild animals. The church at Smyrna was therefore a suffering church. And that, of course, is not an ancient story. The persecution of the people of God has been part of their experience all down through history. We have some 
quite extraordinary accounts of it in our own Scottish history, nearby where I used to live and work in New Mills, they would take you readily to the moors above the villages in the Irvine Valley and show you places where the Covenanters met to worship God in the open air. They would take you to the home of John Brown of Priest Hill, who was shot by the dragoons in front of his wife and children. And this was all because they would not attribute to any other the rights of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is part of the whole history of the Church of Jesus Christ. Many of you will know of situations in places like Eastern Europe and in China. Perhaps some of us may know of the situation in Uganda and Kenya and in some Islamic countries. People have been repeating the words of Peter and John in Acts 5. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Now, of course, that suffering can be infinitely more subtle than the way it appeared in some of these cases I've cited. It can be uniquely personal. It can be private. It can be highly sophisticated. And in the 20th century, it tends in our kind of society to be of that sort. But there are people who are suffering for the sake of Christ. I spoke the other day. I'm sure they would not mind me telling you it, but they are not here this evening. To two girls who were in a flat of the University of Strathclyde here in Glasgow. The other people who shared the flat with them were militant pagans. And these two girls were discovering their lives becoming, as they said, hell on earth. They could not sleep. They were not allowed to read their Bible immediately. They went to do so. The music was turned up to unbearable pitch. And the situation in which they are living is a situation of direct persecution because they belong to what they describe as the God Squad. Now, this is real in the modern world, this suffering. What then was their suffering? That's the first question. The second question is, what does Christ do for their suffering? How does he meet it? How does he minister to it? But first of all, what is it, the suffering? You notice how the ascended Christ uh, describes it. In verse 9, it is described as affliction. The word in the New Testament means pressures. And we use that word, don't we? I'm under a great deal of pressure at the moment, we say. We usually mean because of an abundance of things that we have to do. But there is a different kind of pressure. They were under pressure because of the opposition and persecution that they were experiencing. They knew what it was to feel as though they were being crushed by this kind of experience. Now these pressures would be ultimately physical suffering and death, but a thousand other things were involved. They would, of course, be greatly disadvantaged in that society inasmuch as promotion would be denied them. Uh, trade would become very difficult. They would not be traded with because they were reputed to be Christians. They would be victims of violence in all sorts of different ways. They would be living on edge. That's one of the pressures, wondering what exactly was going to happen next. And the second form of their suffering, do you notice, is poverty. And this is closely related to the pressure and persecution that they were experiencing, partly because they had remained faithful in their testimony to Christ, their trade would have suffered. 
they would not have been allowed to be promoted into more remunerative positions. And it is certainly true that many of them had had their goods pillaged. You remember how in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 34 they speak about suffering the loss of their goods. Now that, of course, is one of the things that they did. It is, of course, true that on many occasions in Christian people's lives, when they are faithful to God, we may cite that promise, those who honor me, I will honor, God says. And we frequently apply that to financial prosperity. But of course it does not always work out that way. Sometimes God honors us by entrusting us with poverty. And this is real poverty. Very interestingly, there are two words in New Testament Greek for poverty. One means I have nothing to spare. The other means I have nothing at all. It is the second word which Paul uses here. It is, in other words, real poverty. And he sometimes makes us spiritually rich while he makes us financially poor. Notice what he says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. But there is a third element in their affliction. It was not only poverty and and, uh, persecution or pressure, It was also slander in verse 9. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now that particular slander uh, was directed in this culture at the Christians because in so many cases they had experienced this protection of the Jewish people. And they were now disowning them and slandering them uh, as those who were blaspheming the gods and being treasonable to the empire. And they wanted to dissociate themselves from them. Notice how... The exalted Christ says, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. In other words, these are not the true people of God. They are only that by name. That, of course, is not only something Scripture applies to the Jews. It is something Scripture applies to all of us. Because somebody professes to be a member of the people of God does not mean that they truly are. Uh, This, of course, is something that goes widely into our own society when people profess to be Christians but reveal by their behavior that they are motivated by the devil rather than by the Lord. But there is another element in it. Do you notice that what Jesus says to them in verse 10 is that worse is yet to come. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. In other words, they are experiencing pressure or affliction. They are knowing poverty. They are experiencing the slander which can not only be personally hurtful, but can in so many ways damage people's lives publicly. Incidentally, if you are ever tempted towards gossip and slander, let me tell you it is infinitely easier to spread than to recover. You can spread slander with the greatest of ease. You cannot recover it very easily. It is, as I heard a little boy saying once, like toothpaste that you squeeze out of a tube. 
It is very easy to get it out, but you cannot get it back in. And it is so with gossip and slander. Oh, if I could only have these words back, but you cannot, and you never will be able to. And the Lord Jesus says, I know the slander of those who say they are God's people, but they are actually motivated by the devil. But worse still is to come, he says. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And of course, many of the prisons of the ancient world had been familiar, not only to ordinary Christians, but to people like the Apostle Paul and his company. They knew what it was to be imprisoned. John himself is writing in exile and therefore in prison in Patmos. And he says there in Smyrna, the Lord Jesus has given this message to them, The devil will put some of you in prison to test you. More than that, you will suffer persecution for ten days. I'll come back to the ten days in a moment or two. You will suffer persecution. And beyond that, be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you a crown of life. So do you see the nature of the suffering? It is pressure, Poverty, slander, prison, persecution, and death itself. Now, I wonder when these people were urged to come to Jesus Christ in the first century, if they knew that that was what it was going to mean for them. Did you know that this is what it can mean to love Jesus? that it is a love that could even take you to death itself. Well, it did for so many of these people. And this, of course, is the answer to so much of this false prosperity doctrine which is being spread around, especially in the United States in these days. God wants you to prosper. God wants you to be healed always. God wants you to be wealthy. Now, the New Testament does not teach that. The New Testament says God may entrust you with incredibly painful pressure. He may entrust you with poverty because he is concerned about spiritual riches. He may allow you to be slandered. He may permit you to go into prison and to suffer persecution and even like godly polycarp to die. But there is another side to all of this. That is the affliction. And here is the Lord Jesus Christ bringing his letter, his word. What does he have to say to them in these circumstances? What is his message? Well, his message is marvelously summed up in one of the things that the Puritans write about this particular letter. You know, there are some marvelous titles the Puritans have for some of their sermons. Um, and, And one of them was this. The Lord Jesus Christ, a suitable Savior for His people in all manner of conditions. Can you imagine somebody getting up and saying today, I would like to speak about the Lord Jesus Christ, a suitable Savior for His people in all manner of conditions. But you get the key to it. He is a suitable Savior. Now, what does he mean? Well, what the Puritan meant was the Lord Jesus Christ was such a Savior as fitted absolutely and to the last detail the needs of His people in whatever condition they were found through all the changing scenes of life, in trouble and in joy. 
Now this is how he reveals himself. We noticed last week that so many of these introductions in the letters to the seven churches come from chapter 1, from the revelation of the glories of the Lord Jesus. But do you notice how he brings, as it were, the most suitable medicine to apply to the wounds of his people at precisely this time? And he does so from his own nature. He points them to himself. And what do they see in him? Well, he says, these are the words of him who is the first and the last. Now, that is one of the descriptions of Jesus. The Alpha and the Omega, it is in chapter 1. He is the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. He is the one who is at the beginning. He is the one who is at the end. And as a name for the Lord Jesus Christ, it is the name which describes him as the Lord of history. He straddles the whole of history from its beginning to its end. Not only does he straddle it, he sovereignly overrules and controls it. The last word in history will not be with men, whether they be Roman emperors or modern politicians or military generals. The last word in history is with God. Now, this is why he says to them, I am the first and the last. Notice the second description of himself, who died and came to life again. Now, what was the ultimate thing that they feared? Unquestionably, it was death. For the great majority of us, death is a most unpleasant prospect. It is something that we look upon with great foreboding. It is not what is beyond death that we fear, but the ugliness of death itself. Death is an ugly intruder into God's world, you see. And there is something about it which rightly causes us foreboding and a sense of distress. But the Lord Jesus speaks as he points them to himself, of himself as the one who died and was raised to life again. Now, do you see that in himself, he has therefore dealt with the ultimate threat. He has dealt with the thing that ultimately stands before them as the power that these enemies of God and the gospel have over them. They have power to bring them to an untimely end. But only power that is given to them by God himself. And the very reality of death has been transformed because he has defeated it. That's why they are to find in him something that will be a medicine for this particular wound. He has drawn death's sting by his sacrificial death for us. He has broken death's power by his resurrection from the grave. And it is in Christ, therefore, that hope is found in death. And we are able to say, therefore, O death, we defy thee, as stronger than thou hast entered thy palace, we fear thee not now. But you notice more than this. He points them to his deep acquaintance with their sorrows and pains. I know, verse 9, your afflictions and your poverty. Now, that can sometimes be a rather shallow, meaningless statement if it is made by people perhaps like ourselves. 
there are some of us who are able to say to people in the midst of a particular kind of suffering, I know exactly what it is that you're going through, and we know that's genuine. And it is a ministry that personal suffering brings in relation to other people, is it not? But you see, the Lord Jesus Christ is able to come to us if you multiply that by infinity. He is able to come to us in the midst of suffering and affliction and pressure and poverty and say, I know. He assures them of his sympathetic understanding. Now, it is directly because of his omniscience, of course. That is, that there is nothing hidden from him. You know how we sometimes say, but nobody knows. The man who wrote the Negro spiritual, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows, and it's true. And then he has the wisdom to add, but Jesus. Nobody knows but Jesus. Because of his omniscience, he knows. There is not a pang in the human heart. There is not an experience in the human spirit. There is not a place that we set our feet. There is not a shudder that goes up our spine. But the Lord Jesus knows it because of his omniscience. But I tell you another way he knows. He knows because of his incarnation. He has become flesh. He has entered our flesh. And when he says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, that knowledge comes because he has been tested in all points like as we are. He knows the frailty of our friend. He understands in a way that no one else can because he has entered into that. That affliction, that pressure, that poverty. Who knew poverty like Jesus? But he knows it also because not only of his omniscience and his incarnation, but because of his indwelling spirit. That is, he not only knows it because he remembers it, in his exalted humanity. He knows it because he indwells the believer and he understands the inside story of every burden of the child of God. And so he says, I know, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. But do you notice he also assures them not only of his sovereignty over the whole of history and of his triumph over the ultimate threat of death and of his understanding of every burden his children bear, but he sets a limit to their suffering. Notice that because it's contained in that phrase, I tell you the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for ten days. In other words, the term of the imprisonment, as most people think that's what it is, the term of the imprisonment, quite beautifully put this, is not decided by a Smyrnian judge it is decided by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Ten days, he says. Now, that doesn't mean literally ten days. He does not tap the judge on the shoulder and say, give him ten days. What is happening is that he is saying there is a limit, and ten days is a symbolic figure in the book of Revelation, as almost all figures are sevens and multiples of seven, the figure of a thousand. Are, these are symbolic figures, 144,000. These are all symbols. Ten 
is a symbol. It is simply to say this will be a period which will be decided by the exalted Christ and not by the minds of men. It is simply what the Apostle Paul is saying when he writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10.13 and says, There is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God will make a way of escape so that you can bear it. And He will not, and this is the bit, He will not suffer you to be tempted beyond what you are able to bear. Now, do you see how he is saying it is God who is going to put the limit upon the testing? We might perhaps disagree with God's timing and say it is beyond time that this was stopped. Especially is that not true when we sometimes look upon people we love in Christ and they are going through trials and we cry out, Oh God, it is far past time that they were relieved of these burdens. But there is a perfect timekeeper on the throne of glory. And it is he who will hold up his hand and say, stop. And the persecution stops like that. It happened that way for Job. When God said, now you may do this and you may do that, but you mustn't do this, you may test him here but not there and you must stop at that point he sets the boundaries of testing and temptation and that's what the Lord Jesus is going to do and finally you will notice how he gives to them the ultimate secret be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. Now, you know what the crown is, of course. The crown, if you are called Stephen, you have the name which uses this Greek word for a crown, Stephanos. And the name it comes from the, the games, you know, very common in Smyrna. Now, in modern Olympic games, they give somebody a gold medal. In the ancient Olympic Games, they would give him a crown made of leaves. And this would be the victor's crown. It was a sign of victory. Now he says, be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the victor's crown. And finally, he who has an ear to hear the same, uh, the same refrain as in the other letters, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who is victorious, he who overcomes. And you will remember they overcame through the blood of the Lamb. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Now, there's a mysterious phrase. What is the second death? Well, of course, the first death was physical death. But that is not the thing that makes death serious. As you will remember with Adam and Eve, the judgment that God pronounced upon them potentially in chapter 2 of Genesis, was you must not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, of course, when they did eat of it, do you remember what happened? In the day they ate of it, they did not drop down dead like Ananias and Sapphira. They were still walking about. So what was this 
promise or threat or judgment that God gave to them, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Well, I tell you what it is. They did die later on, of course. And that outward physical death was just the seal on the death they died that day because they were banished from the presence of God. And that is the second death. Do not fear him, says Jesus, who has the power to destroy the body. And that is all that he can do. Don't fear him. But I tell you who to fear. Fear him who has power to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's the second death. Now, how to avoid the second death? I tell you. It's really very simple. Like all true biblical doctrine, it's very simple. How do you avoid the second death? The answer is by the second birth. That's how you avoid the second death. Because the second death is the destruction of soul and body. It is the separation of men and women from God through all eternity. But for those who have been born of the Spirit of God, The second death, Jesus says in this letter to Smyrna, the second death will not touch them. You need not fear, therefore. And they will find in the Lord Jesus, who has gained the victory over death and hell and all the kingdoms of Satan, you will find in him a suitable Savior for his people in all manner of conditions. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for your holy word and for your glorious Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is a full and sufficient Savior. And we come to cast ourselves afresh upon him this evening and to ask that we may find in him our life and all our hope and joy for the glory of his great name. Amen.